Welcome back to the Tea Talks podcast. I'm your host, Sean. And yes, we have another amazing guest. Now today, we have Sam, who's an engineer, who's been at Foundation Marketplace from the beginning. So he's been involved with every little detail in regards to building the marketplace. So we talk about Foundation from the beginning to what they're doing now, what they're doing in the future to plan to help artists, talking about smart contracts. So there's so much value in this. Uh, we really dig deep into the technical side and also just looking on how they can advance and help artists in the NFT space. So guys, get your notepads out. Please subscribe, share, and let's help build this community. Welcome back to the NFT Talks podcast, and I'm here with uh, Sam Mason de Keres. Now, he's a, he's been working for the Foundation <laughs> NFT Marketplace from pretty much from the beginning. So I'm really excited to get him on the podcast to talk about his journey because I would I like to say he's got skin in the game. He's seen <laughs> a lot, and he's and he can and he's also involved with a lot of things changing. So I'm happy to have you on, Sam. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm really good, Sean. How are you? Yeah, I'm not too bad, man. And if anyone listening, you can tell that he's got that UK accent. He's not far from me. <laughs> and I always love somebody yeah. from the UK. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, originally actually from like Bir- just outside of Birmingham way, um, like south of Birmingham, now living in London, but uh, only for the last 10 years. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, you, you're, still, you're still holding on to the accents. So I'm, I, I feel at home because I'm, I'm really yeah. from Birmingham myself. So um, yeah, I always like to speak to people that are local. I still got love people in the US. Uh, well, you know, you can't beat somebody from the UK that knows everything you, what you're about and whatnot, especially from the same town. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so um, that's really interesting. Like the fact that okay, you're from my town, and mm. like I always, I always say this, and and I really have to t- touch on it is that I really thought there was nobody in the UK that was really involved with the NFT space, um. And the fact that you've got yourself that has been involved, which we'll go into, and you've got like known origin and has been involved like from the beginning. There are things the UK are driving this space also. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, yeah, I'm obviously work at Foundation and there we're a completely globally distributed company. So it's not even like everyone sat in SF or like New York. We have people in chicago we have people down in florida we've got people like on in various other cities like spread across the us we also have uh matt vernon who's one of our co-founders he's actually based in sydney um and so he's like wrapped around the entire other side of the world and then in the uk we have uh, myself and also um one of the other engineers is based in london as well in west london um so yeah so it it is it seems like there is less of us but we are here and present like we are doing (laughs) stuff for the space um obviously there's a lot of artists in the space as well um who are contributing to kind of like the uk nft art scene as well which is like super impressive i think you know we've got we've got some really impressive names that we can kind of add to this uh kind of roster so it's definitely just getting more of the engineering kind of and the rest of the kind of wider community involved as well yeah, I think you guys, engineers, backend developers, block, being on blockchain are like gold dust. I don't know a lot. <laughs> yeah, a lot people, no, so. there's, it's definitely like Web3 as like a kind of broad sense of engineering. Like there, it is, I'm, I'm getting DMs more and more every single day from friends who are, you know, I've worked with them in like, you know, quote unquote Web2 <laughs> companies in the past. And I'm very recently starting to get more and more people kind of reaching out to me being like, so I've like heard about NFTs or crypto or like, I hear you can like build stuff on top of it. Like where's, how do I get involved? Like, how do I find a job in this community and like kind of start jumping in? Um, For a lot of people, it's like that experimentation phase where they're just like finding it for the first time. They want to know what's capable, like where all the kind of rabbit holes are. Um, And then once you give them the tools and the places to go, they'll kind of start heading down those routes to kind of come back. Um, so yeah, there's uh, yeah. there's not many of us, but we are growing pretty rapidly in terms of like engineering resources and stuff. Yeah, you, you touched on about the experimental stage. I feel that everyone is still there. I mean, I'm sure that foundation oh, totally. is still experimenting 
with things and seeing what works and whatnot. So if you're at, if you are interested in this space, I always say to people, and I get a lot of people come to myself and say, where do we make the profit? I'm like, it's not like that. It's not like I could never, even if I couldn't even say where to make the profit, really being realistic about it. I could, I can give you an idea what to invest in potentially, but doesn't mean you're going to make any profit. I said, if you're here now, you're here to build and be a part of what's going on. Yeah, totally. I mean, there's, there is definitely like, yeah, like you said, at foundation, we are, we're still a startup, right? Like we've been going since February and it's kind of like in its kind of current form. Um, and, you know, the space is moving a hundred miles per hour. February being, feels like 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, and if we, you know, there's that classic phrase that if you don't disrupt yourself or if you're not constantly trying to disrupt yourself, then someone else will. And in a space like this, like unless we at foundation, like the people are already building the product, if we're not trying to out innovate ourselves and like, you know, rethink what's possible, then someone else is going to come down the road in, you know, a matter of months and try and do that for us. So um, there are obviously some things that make it both easier and more difficult to innovate when you're already, you know, you've already built our platform. Like you can't innovate and just dump everything that you've already built you have to try and like bring that community with you and bring the platform with you um and bring what works with you but then at the same time it's very easy to understand if something is going to work or not because there are so many people using the platform every single day <laughs> that if you launch something and it picks up no traction then you can kind of get a sense that like people aren't interested in this or at least not at the moment or maybe we've gone maybe we've gone too far out uh, yeah, and we need yeah. to kind of like bring it back um, so yeah, there, there's definitely pros and cons. And I think in terms of individuals, like, yeah, I, I, I mean, I certainly have my fair share of people reaching out to me and asking like, oh, you know, what should I invest in? What NFT should I buy? Um, what do you and, say? I want to hear what, what do you say? I want to, I want to, if you got a generic answer for that, cause I'm always interested, like people really get on my back. Like you, well, you don't know, what, you don't know how to make money in this. I'm like, it's not really. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, I mean, I certainly don't pretend to be like a, a trader. Like I've generally been of the sense that I've, I think I've only of all of the pieces that I've bought, I've only attempt like really tried to sell one piece onwards because I'm very much in the phase where like, I love the art that I've collected. I love the mm -hmm. entities that I've collected. I'm very passionate about the artists that I've like supported and I'm in the very privileged position where I, I don't have to try and flip it or try and like make a profit very short term. Um, and if I do, it's, if I do end up selling a piece, it will be more a conversation with the artist to kind of understand like, you know, what's your current floor? What would you want yeah. to go for this? Like, is there any particular collector that you would want this to kind of get sold to? And we can like try and have a, a dialogue between it rather than just going yeah. to foundation or open sea or rareable and like listing it on secondary for some arbitrary amount so when people kind of ask me about what should i buy to me it's always been obviously there's a few key things like don't spend what you can't afford to lose because okay. you know like all these things like you said we're in a massive experimental space like every some of these projects can go to zero very quickly some of them can go to zero and come back up again like in if you're if you're in that mindset of like, I've got to sell X by X date because like I need to recoup any expenditure, then more often than not, you're going to come up short and you're going to panic and then you're probably going to lose out. Um, so a lot of mine, like when I've been buying things, I, I've i definitely lent more into the one of one world, uh, probably because I work at foundation. So I'm yeah. exposed <laughs> to that world, like way more in depth. Um, I do have like a few, you know, more kind of collectible pieces, but um, they're more from like small, like non 10 K projects. Um, and so, yeah, for me, it's just been around like, do I like, do I like the artist? Do I like the art? Like, does it visually look good now that I've created like a, like a, you know, fairly sizable collection? Like, does it fit in with the rest of my collection? Like, is there a, a kind of core like theme that runs through that collection? Does this add to that? Um, or take away from that um, and then if it is a part of a collection a lot of the time it's do it has to be doing something exciting so like blip maps like by Dom Hoffman like I love that because I've been following Dom for a long time we kind of spoke when he was getting into the space for the first time and he had all these amazing ideas and I just love the diet the kind of the ethos behind it and the kind of mechanics that are going into it 
and like where that world is going. Um, and with some of his other more experimental pieces, I love those because they're generally doing kind of crazy stuff on chain, like in the smart contracts themselves. And as an engineer, I generally get attracted to like innovation in that space because that's where my, I spend most of my time. I'm an engineer myself. So yeah. Okay. So I think that's a sound advice in regards to basically like look at the projects, invest your time into what you're, you're looking into. Like you just don't, you don't chuck your money at anything. So make no. sure you look into it and do your due diligence, connect with the project. If it is a PFP project or with the art and, and then yeah, be prepared to lose the money, but also it can be a positive. Like let's, let's put a disclaimer out there. There are people, there is people making money out there. Oh, of course. Time, yeah. And whatnot, but they've Absolutely. invested a lot of time into this. <laughs> yeah i mean there's there's always going to be people there's always going to be people making money in this space and i think like any profession where there's lots of people and some people make huge like gains like over short seemingly short periods of time yeah generally they are people who have either been doing it for a hell of a long time and they a lot of the time they don't talk about the losses that they've made but <laughs> all they you know all you see is the gains which is understandable because it makes them look you know makes us look you know, those people look good um but yeah it's really about those people have generally for the most part spent a huge amount of time in the space already they've cultivated like a community around them they are you know some people reach a stage where like them just being associated with the project kind mm -hmm. of makes the project grow which i <laughs> yeah, guess yeah. you know is kind of like the end result hopefully but also it's about generally those people are are genuine in the space they've been here for a long time they've seen us come up from nothing they've watched the dips they've kind of ridden the highs and now they're kind of they're taking those gains back and they're saying like yeah i put a huge amount of time in now i'm going to come back there's obviously a massive long tail of people who have spent large amounts of money and not you know and have seemingly lost it although i guess you only lose if you kind of sell the piece for a loss yeah. but um <laughs> Yeah, there are people who, yeah, haven't chosen the quote unquote right projects or projects that have taken off or, you know, they've bought into projects where the creators of those projects and this is a growing trend as well. There are creators out there in like in any kind of community or any kind of like part of the of any kind of scene mm -hmm. where they're just in it for the money. And once they launch the project, they disappear immediately after and they like dump it and everyone feels like they've got, you know, quote unquote rugged. Um, so yeah, like, you know, do your due diligence, like do your own research. Don't, you know, by all means, like listen to hundreds of people, but come up with your own decisions as to kind of what you like and what you want. And if there are any internal alarm bells ringing, like, you know, use that basically. <laughs> well, obviously you've been in the space for a long time. So that's where that vast amount of experience and knowledge comes from. Um, at least bring it back like because I know obviously we've had a talk before and I know about your story and I really want listeners and the watchers to understand when you actually entered the space to what you were doing at first to how much growth and we're not we're not talking five months here <laughs> we're talking a couple a few years so um yeah let's start from there yeah sure so I mean if we go back to the the kind of advent of when I like really kind of first put my foot into this pool, it was I think it was around 2014. Wow. Um, and it was obviously at the time there was like, it wasn't Bitcoin, it was this project actually called Stella. Um, and Stella was a project that was trying to and still is trying to uh, enable micro payments. Um, so they had this kind of this thing called Lumen. Um, and this token Lumen was essentially, it was backed by I think Stripe or the founders from Stripe, Patrick and um, Simon Collison, like put some money into it. And to me, it just seemed interesting because it was programmable. It came with like an SDK. Mm -hmm. um, and basically if you went onto the website, you could earn this Lumen by doing really basic things like connect your social profile to verify and like you get airdrops, a certain amount of tokens. Are and so I did that. I played around with the SDK a little bit. I kind of entered in like a few of the like little hackathons that they were doing. Um, and obviously at the time, like these lumens were worth nothing. They, there was like Ethereum hadn't even been created at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and it was kind of, or it was certainly in its extreme early days. Um, and so I got all these tokens and then time carried on. I kind of like carried on in the space, but I always kind of that, part of the world like it's programmable money kind of always really interested me 
Um, and then cut to kind of, I guess, kind of 2016 was when I really started kind of like paying more attention. Like I'd seen Bitcoin kind of going up and up and up um, and it was like interesting, but there was something about it to me personally that didn't like really resonate. Like it wasn't programmable. There are, there were parts of it that were trying to do that, but it felt like it hadn't been built for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Um, and then suddenly like, you know, Ethereum was starting to take off as well. And I was like, ah, this is exactly like more what I want to be a part of. Like a, something that has like a Turing complete language on top of it. You write these things called smart contracts. You can control things inside of it. It's all kind of executed on chain. I was like, that feels like what I resonate with. Yeah. Um, and of course, around that time was the beginning of like, I guess what would now be known as like DeFi. Um, but it was this concept of people creating these like tokens and like had different functionality and for different projects. Um, and I kind of participated very kind of like lightly in that. And I was just like kind of interested in the programming language and solidity. Um, and then, yeah, I, I watched DeFi summer happen in like 2017 and I was kind of like party to that a little bit. I saw like all the massive like ICO booms and crashes and like everything kind of fell away. Um, and while it was interesting it and it kind of got, got me hooked, like the kind of banking aspect of it didn't, like I'm not a financial person, like I don't, you know, it's never really kind of interested me. And I've always sat more at the side of like the creative arts and like technology, like working in tandem with each other. So at the end of 2017, after like DeFi summer had like boomed and busted a little bit, um, started seeing these like crypto kitties and like these collectibles. And I was like, yeah, this kind of like hits the spot a little bit. Like, you know, crypto kitties like doing these cool things on chain where it's like Pokemon cards, but yeah. you're like, you know, you're trading and they have mechanics <laughs> where you can evolve them and like breed them and I was like yes this this feels like these kind of toy what seemingly felt like toys at the time like but these concepts like really started resonating and so yeah I just kind of got more and more into that space and I kept an eye on it and I still had my like day job and I was still doing that in like kind of traditional tech mm -hmm. um, but I was following along um, and then yeah it really got to like when I really started jumping into like NFTs was, or like kind of more seriously was uh, probably like January, February of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a bit of spare time and I was like looking for a little side project. Um, I was browsing like these different kind of, uh, just browsing Twitter for like these cool new products. And I stumbled across both Zora and Foundation, like pretty much the same day. Um, and at the time they were doing this concept of uh, you had a token that you could as a creator kind of like put out into this, these platforms and people would buy the tokens and then they could burn them to redeem like a physical good. So a print or, you know, a trainer or a RAC mixtape, which was what Zura okay. did. So, so at that, um, so to that yeah. point, they weren't even doing that for NFT. They weren't doing it for digital goods. It was just attached to, to physical goods. Exactly. Yeah. It was That's still crazy. like <laughs> NFTs was still like very much like an unheard of term. Like it was very much seen as a toy kind of idea concept. Um, but it just got me hooked because I was like, yeah, this is amazing. Like you're kind of bridging that art and tangible and turning like, burning mechanics and like, yeah. you know, turning something digital into physical and blah, blah, blah. I was like, it feels really cool. So I reached out to them, uh, to both teams and just said, do you have like an open API that I can like, doodle around on and like hack on a project um and foundation got back to me i think it's cave on like got back to me straight away saying uh who's the one of the founders of yeah. uh, foundation saying actually yeah we've been looking for like a community kind of project where someone could build this like almost like a tracker for like the activity that's happening on the platform um because we want this to be a community project we want like people to feel like they have access to this open data so I was like, yeah, it sounds great. Like gives me kind of time to stretch my legs and like play around with what's out there at the moment. And so that's when I started diving in. And that was, yeah, pretty much like February kind of of 2020. Um, I followed um, I followed the team for a while. Um, I kind of helped them with certain kind of projects they're working on as they were building out the platform. Um, and then towards the end of the year, um, it had become very apparent that like NFTs were about to kind of hit or like 
things were changing in people's mindsets. What was it? Um, was it that was that stood out for you? That was it like NBA Top Shots or what was it that? Really stood out for um, you? I think what it was for me was it was actually so before kind of foundation kind of pivoted into this like purely NFT. They tried to do both, so they would they started working with artists and say, look, instead of shipping a physical print, how yeah. about you mint this thing called an NFT on the blockchain? It's like the art is there. And like when I first saw that, I was like, it feels weird with like one-on-one -on -one art, like, you know, mm -hmm. and then I started seeing like the art that these artists were putting out and I was like, oh my God, like, yeah, this kind of lives uh, perfectly in this world. Like the people can own these tokens that like represent this like really high, like quality, beautiful like art and from like really like well-established artists. Yeah. Um, so for me, that felt like that felt like the obvious choice i was like okay and people were buying it people you know buying these one of ones um and for me at the time i was like wow this just feels like completely like ungraspable like i can't believe it um and so then i just started digging in found all these other platforms that kind of existed in this kind of nft space as well and were kind of building out their plat their respective platforms and i was still a bit unsure like is this going to be like like the ICO boom, like I'd seen like people get burnt by blockchain kind of ups and downs before. And I'd lived through a few of the hype cycles. So I was kind of like, you know, what's going to land here? And then, yeah, it kind of got to, it got to kind of post Christmas 2021, like this year. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I was like, you know what? Like I felt like I'd, I'd kind of done everything I could do uh, at my kind of current role in like web two. And I was, found myself over the Christmas period and the holidays, like just going deeper and deeper down this rabbit hole. And then I had the team, the foundation team kind of reaching out to me, just like, look, we're like hiring and we want to build out a bigger team. Um, and so, yeah, in February, I was like, yeah, let's, let's make the jump. So yeah, it's basically gone from like 2014 to kind of noodling around with like micro payment platforms to like cut to now, like still doodling around with like smart contracts, but on a much larger scale. Uh, and with as, as crazy that is man and the thing the thing is like i feel that the real okay the the, the real, if you agree the real the boom was in say the start of the year 2021 in regard taking to the next level off the i mean off the back of obviously people i'd say nba top shots growing the interest yeah. around there um and then i, I guess that you would say the punks the, of the yeah. punks that they were going for i mean you didn't you said you're around when the, you mentioned the crypto kitties but you didn't mention the punks like no, I mean, yeah. Did like, you not get one? Was you not I around didn't, didn't get them one, out? no. <laughs> much, to my, uh, much to my deep regret, I didn't, uh, I didn't get on that, uh, on that bandwagon. Um, yeah, it was kind of, yeah, even they kind of took me a bit by surprise. Like, I saw them, but again, at the time, like, it felt so early. I was like, I was kind of focusing on crypto keys because they had all these cool mechanics associated with yeah, them. Yeah. And then when I looked at, like, the punks, I was like, it's cool. Like, I like low bit art, like, you know, 8 bit art, but is, what else is it like i didn't realize that they would become you know the the kind of seemingly de facto standard for like the og nft so i was like damn yeah that, that was my experience for the apes man i mean i tell you probably people listening to the podcast probably heard me mention it a few times but the same thing i was like okay the art's cool but didn't have any idea that i understand it now obviously because i've watched it grow and i've seen what's happened yeah but it's just yeah it's just crazy you think at the time it was nothing like that and, and no, absolutely. And, and what's happened is crazy. I mean, at the time, like I was the same with the apes. Like I missed completely missed the like missed that point in time because I'd been pretty heads down with like building, um, and we'd been like building out foundations. We were kind of hitting that peak hype uh, that was happening earlier on in the year, uh, or at least peak for this cycle, let's say. Yeah. Um, and. I'd, I'd just seen so, I was so burnt out from so many different projects like coming and going and people like diving into them. And, and then I saw Apes land and I was like, it's just another one of those projects. Like it just felt, it felt too similar. And I just disregarded it as like, yeah, we're like, we're at the end of a hype cycle. Nothing that happens now until the next hype cycle is gonna like matter really. 
Um, so I just, yeah, completely disregarded it and was like, nope, it's done. <laughs> I, uh, feel, I feel that I was going to say, sorry, I feel the same if, when you're saying that like, that whole approach is like, and you I don't forget that you take, you've got to take in consideration that you were focused. You're, you're not solely focused on buying like these PFPs. You actually working and building. And mm. my, my focus myself wasn't really just buying, I was, I was aware of what's going on, but I wasn't out here just buying a, like all these PFP projects. Like you said, it was, it becomes overwhelming. There was a project dropping okay at that time was probably like every week um, yeah and even week, that felt yeah and that, and that felt a lot top. of the time not like yeah 20 a day but <laughs> every yeah. week you're like oh it's just another one of these projects i did the same thing with the uh, rumble kongs um oh, yeah so i was in there early and got distracted with doing work missed i was watching it in the discord and then it sold out i even had the founder on my on the podcast and stuff like that really? but still didn't get one at the time which is crazy but yeah, like you can easily get distracted and you, can't, you just completely can't pick yourself. <laughs> no, exactly. And I think, you, you know, if you spend too much time like beating yourself up over every, you know, missed opportunity, like you'll go crazy because there's, you know, there's going to be like constant, constant innovation out there and constant projects that do well and like catch you off guard. Um, which why I guess I've kind of made my peace with like, I will buy stuff that I like the art of or the founders or like I've got strong conviction in and you know if if they don't work out they don't work out and if they do work out then it's like well yeah I kind of like you know it's a lot of the time it's a bit of feels like a bit of a crap sheet yeah. where you're just like tossing the coin um so yeah okay um so let's let's go into um obviously talk about foundation obviously you mentioned yeah foundation started in February um 2021 um obviously it's one of the biggest uh, NFT marketplaces out there. Um, very popular, uh, invite only. Mm. So that's another thing. I remember um, the early stages, probably like perfect much around April. There was like mm -hmm. for me, everyone was trying to get this this gun foundation. Everyone yeah. was like, "How do I get an invite? How do I get an invite?" That's, I know that people are trying to sell them and stuff like that, saying and all, yep. all, all kind of things going on. So um, is that still the case now? In regards to like are people trying to sell them. You can actually con confirm how do you get an invite? What's the process? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you can touch on that. Yeah, sure. So, yes, people. So we like actively discourage people selling invites to each other because we don't want people to. We don't feel like people like should have to buy an invite to get invited to then like you know mint things just to get access to the platform. Um, and so we are actively. So you know, back in April when all these kind of like it was going crazy people were trying to sell invites and these invite rings and like it was just kind of going a bit over the top um at that time was when we really started hammering down our kind of like trust and safety team and really started focusing on like developing internal tools to kind of detect and weed out these kind of bad actors in the system um and it was really important for us like even over like features that we made sure we got on top of this because we wanted to pride ourselves that like everyone who was on this platform was has you know is a legitimate artist or at least starting out in the space um yeah. even if they're just starting out like are a legitimate artist and that no one is like almost creating like secondary like mechanisms to like try and get themselves in or people getting kind of screwed out of money basically which is like not what we not what our kind of one of our goals is so we've always been there and we've always been creator and kind of community first and this just felt like a really high priority for us to kind of stamp out so over that time we've kind of like got on top of it and there's a lot of like you know it's it is still happening but hopefully a lot less because we've got things in place where we can like get a, you know get to it very quickly without it happening to like people getting kind of caught out uh, and we've got a really incredible trust and safety team who spend a lot of their waking hours like dealing with these issues and we are as a team of engineers building out more and more tools to kind of like get ahead of these kind of bad actors yeah. um but yeah in terms of like how people get i mean at the moment the only way to really get a an invite is being given one by another creator essentially or another member of the community who has creator access uh when you become a member you get a certain amount of invites uh, you can distribute those invites to whoever you want um, and they can redeem. And that is kind of how we kind of proliferate that that thing. It's like, hopefully, and also like, we want people to feel assured that 
well, the the invites kind of serve like double purpose, right? They give people access to the platform in terms of they can mint and become a creator. But then also one thing that we want people to do is kind of raise their, it hopefully will raise their profile that, you know, if you go to someone who might be a, you know, somewhat unknown artist, maybe they're an emerging artist in the space. If you can scroll down on their profile, you see that they've connected there and verified their other social network profiles, but also it shows who they were invited by. Um, mm. That is like quite high signal. Cause you know, if you see like, oh, they're invited by an artist that I really respect, then it's like, brilliant. Okay, I'm gonna like, yeah, like, uh, yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. co-sign, right? It's like, yeah. I'm gonna, I have faith that like they gave an invite to this person because they saw their art and they respect them as a person. And it also is like a, a verification method for that artist, right? It's like, I'm only gonna give artists, I'm not just gonna like throw out links or like sell them to people um because i want to make sure that like i'm not attaching my name and my brand to some other person who's just gonna like you know do something bad or become a bad actor in the space so that's how it works at the moment we're obviously constantly looking for like different mechanisms different ways to kind of open up the funnel like larger um at the moment for us it's like it's really on focusing on like the you know we want to make sure that the people that we kind of that come onto the platform and join the platform are given the best experience and so like sometimes we have to kind of like you know slow that kind of like incoming groups of requests because like any startup we're trying to scale our platform to meet demands yeah. we want to make sure that like the existing people on the platform are getting the you know a really great experience as well as people coming on so yeah sometimes we have to tweak that on like how many invites people get and like da 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 but um yeah the general the general philosophy is is that eventually we would love to reach to a point where we have you know we anyone can come on and we can like still verify that the quality is there what we don't want to do is open up the floodgates and suddenly it just be a you know a complete open sea wash <laughs> <laughs> yeah where it's like it's very difficult to understand and verify who like which projects are actual the actual projects which are scam yeah. projects which are like real people uh contributing to the to the nft ecosystem yeah okay so you touched on a few things i really find it interesting that the fact the co-signed that's is that what you're trying to do with that is i like that um it makes sense it's like obviously you inviting somebody out that you co-sign another artist and then it also gives people that don't know about the artist to go okay that guy he's co-signed him i'll look into that so that i didn't know that because i mean i thought okay simply fomo uh make oh, of course, it, yeah. ma making an exclusive club to get into everybody wants to get in if you can't get in the more you want to get in <laughs> yeah. that aspect yeah, of yeah. it you, you know what i mean so um but if that's the approach that you've taken um yeah i think that's that's good for the space definitely yeah and we're like we you know we want to use that like that the way that people are invited to kind of really you know we're constantly looking at better ways that we can add things add like add features to the platform where discoverability is made easier so it's like you know whether that's super basic stuff like search or you know using the invite trails that people have that person's invited that person's invited that person like kind of yeah. using that kind of like that data to really kind of like surface uh you know really amazing upcoming artists because it's all very well and good saying like oh we're going to verify the people with the most amount of twitter followers or that are verified on twitter yeah. themselves but then you're always going to be you're always going to be just breeding the same people like the same people are going to get verified the same people are going to sell more art because yeah. they are just uh you know they're always going to be at the top because they've got the most people it's a self-serving prophecy that they will always be the most popular because they already are the most popular um and which is another reason why we still are like we have an amazing curation team you know the the team that we have um that work at foundation have come from have you know they've not just been here for like six months in the kind of like in the nft space they've been working at like world-renowned galleries around the world and they work for like world-renowned kind of publications and they you know they sit on the boards and kind of groups of these like different galleries and various communities that are out there and they're like heavily engaged and so that what that allows them to do is that they can lift up other artists because they know that like oh i've been following this person for a while mm -hmm. they haven't like you know 
they their art is amazing but they might not have twenty thousand followers so let's like let's bring them up let's raise them to the platform like you know the whole point of the web free space in general is to uplift people who have maybe you know people who have come from the traditional worlds where they're wherever they're coming from art world music world and have been either like ignored or pushed aside and it's like this is this has to, this new space has to work for everyone mm -hmm. equally and like lift people up who have otherwise been you know forgotten about or pushed to one side or kind of ignored like otherwise we're just building the same systems that we had before which is pointless because we already have that system and it's broken right. so, so I, I want to ask you something i've got a, while you were saying all that i've, I've got a, an idea so like i'm gonna say okay. i don't know if it exists already so if i do get it and so if sorry if it doesn't exist make sure i get credited for it right so okay. <laughs> right, so um so you the invite system obviously you invite another artist now have you mm -hmm. got algorithms in place to when you're showing that artist's work who's had the invite that below as suggestions to buy the other person's artwork that they've invited so as it stands at the moment we don't we have that data we're not surfacing that data anywhere yeah um but it is an in, it is an incredibly interesting yeah it's an incredibly interesting like proposition right it's like oh i go to some very famous artists page yeah. and they have invited x y and z and somewhere on that page is like surfacing that um yeah, that's a great idea. Like, right, we, make sure I get the credit for that. <laughs> okay, yeah. Make sure you can, you you can drop that, that in the meeting. You know, make sure I get I'll the credit. Drop it in the next product meeting. Um, and because then, yeah, like we need more. There needs to be more surfaces, more mechanisms to kind of surface those other artists. Generally, what we've been doing at the moment, for better or for worse, mm -hmm. is on artist pages. So and I think that's like you know your username at foundation or this piece of artwork that lives that you've created mm -hmm. at the moment we've been very conscious of like just showing that artist's context around them right so it's like if you're on their profile page everything on that profile page is theirs if you're on um if you're on their artwork page everything on that artwork page is theirs right like anything related or otherwise is theirs um mostly because we also like you know algorithms are great mm -hmm. but we've seen that they don't like if they're left untended or if they are used mm -hmm. maliciously <laughs> then they can be they can cause worse issues than like you know just let's just look at facebook as an example or yeah, like yeah. instagram like in like algorithms on their own are not like a solution like not a solution to mm -hmm. a problem right like you need that human level of well hope, yeah you need that human level of curation to and the algorithms can help they can kind of work in sync um but you need that to kind of like live together for okay. that to work yeah. um but i think you bring up a kind of wider point right which is curation as it stands at the moment on foundation is largely done well like it, we have a curation team we also have this kind of concept of worlds where we've kind of like picked certain creators to kind of promote other artists that they like in their own theme so these worlds are like can be anything it could be like a theme it could be you know a location based kind of thing but i think thinking even bigger than that is like we need to give like curation needs to have as much worth as like as an artist if that makes sense so we allow um artists to sell their work we need to create a mechanism that curators can also earn money like a sustainable amount of income from having the skills to curate like not everyone's an artist right yeah. not everyone is a media maker yeah. but there is another section of a group of people who are incredible tastemakers and yeah. curators and have a vision for like you know the future and they and it's it's you know we as one team based out of like however many countries we're based out of we are still you know the 0. 0.00001 percent of like like being able to see everything that's happening in the wider world right mm -hmm. so we need to kind of create a mechanism that allows people to who are tastemakers to be able to say look i might not be able to be kind of creating this art but i'm 
finding these people and bringing them together all these pieces of art and bringing them together and then displaying that and people then say yeah I follow this person because they've got incredible taste and I'm gonna buy that piece of art or kick off an auction for that art um and that person who curated that or who kind of like got that name out there should earn something right they should earn a commission they should earn something from that because their their skills are incredible like you know mm -hmm. not everyone in this world like taste is a very important thing and a very like hard to come by thing in this world especially when you're like you're saying when there's a drop every single week and now there's like multiple drops every single day like how do you sift how do you hone in on the like the signal in that sea of noise right mm -hmm. how do you kind of like and it has to be through curatorial like processes right where people uh, have their finger on the pulse and are spending that time and effort and that time and effort should be rewarded all right so and the, what, okay so to add what to what you just said there i think that's i think that's really i think it's cool that you guys are even looking into that because you're right there are the guys out there just like good at curating and to offer that, that that'd be great i thought that's a great tool what if because a lot of these artists are also collectors i think that's the nft space they've become collectors themselves so a lot of people they do recommend or they try and co-sign they end up collecting their work anyway so i was worried about that was it <laughs> seen it appear on the screen like a cat walking across the screen. yeah sorry cat, uh, this, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's all right cat. it's all right we're live we're live <laughs> so, yeah, in. so back yeah back to what i was saying so yeah. what if you did something a functionality i'm not sure how it'd work if whoever an artist co-signs when if a buyer collects maybe three of the, the artists that have been co-signed for that one person then that artist is rewarded if that makes sense mm. or maybe so, they can do a donation to encourage people to buy the the, the other artist's work by saying if you buy five pieces five pieces of work from these five artists of I've, I've kind of co-signed then you will get a piece from me so yeah i mean all these mechanisms like make sense, right? I think it's, it's, I think when we're approaching like all of these kind of like these problems, future features and stuff like that, we're always trying to think through how do they compose together, right? Like it's all very well and good having this like really nice and like uh, kind of elaborate process. But if that doesn't compound with other features on the platform, yeah, then it's, it's kind of sits siloed from the rest of it. Like it's value proposition is like amazing, but it's solely dependent on that feature working or being successful. Um, whereas the way that we've always approached things at foundation is composability. Like, you know, you have, uh, well, you have the ability to mint, right? Mint and list. And it's like, great, okay, you can do that. And then we brought out splits and it's like, right, you can now split that and that's you know that composes with the primitive of being able to mint an nft and list that nft and that happens in perpetuity for those however many split recipients and then we brought out like most recently like as of last week we brought out collections and the ability to create your own collection as an artist so previously artists would mint to the foundation contract which is like just a 720 contract with a bunch of stuff in it um but we are starting to see more and more people in the community say, actually, I want, I want to have, I want my own contracts. I want my own like provenance. I want my mark my own piece of land on the blockchain, and everything that goes into that uh, contract is mine and verifiably mine. It's not like, you know, sitting next to some other like token ID that represents some other artist works. Like everything I mint is mine, and so we bore that out, and then that composes because that then connects to our splits like you can split work that you mint on your own contract which you can then mint to and then list in an auction and so the idea is like yeah if artists going back to like your original point if artists want to say because yeah a lot of artists are also collectors they will go out there and oftentimes they are some of the best curators as well right because mm -hmm. they're so entrenched in that they're so deep in that space they are looking at what is selling what isn't selling who's who they see these like you know up and coming like really incredible artists coming out from the space because they're like constantly watching and so yeah they can like whether that is built into a contract somehow or some other mechanism um it probably does make sense to say like look yeah 
if you buy like I rep you know I'm co-signing this artist I really think they're amazing if you buy x amount of pieces like I'll you know put you on like the white list or like pre-mint for my next drop for example um and I don't necessarily think like that has to live on a contract somewhere right or it doesn't have to be a feature but it can be a, an expression of uh that artist's kind of like how they how they want to kind of encourage people and yeah like you know foundation could realistically provide the mechanism where people can customize a page to kind of like give those uh like so they can like you know sound that out and be like yes i will do this x y and z yeah. um but i think the core primitives are you know curator like curatorial feet like fees somehow and that is like baked into the contract and that is like you know there's still obviously a lot of complexity and like trying to understand how that works but yeah okay yeah so okay so these are things that could protect, obviously that because we're at the beginning stages experimenting these are things that you absolutely can into and i guess you'll find that sweet spot uh once you've over time what works and what doesn't work yeah exactly i think um yeah, I think, you know, we're constantly trying to experiment and we're constantly trying to figure out like what works, what doesn't work, where's the highest value in the space, uh, what is, it's not only about like new technology as well, it's a lot of the time it's like new behaviours that start to form and you start to kind of see them bubbling up, like people are like manually creating these things. So like, almost like what you just talked about, right? It's like right. an artist might say, oh yeah, if you buy three of this contract's work, then I will like, you'll automatically be airdropped. Like that could, if that like picked up enough like proliferation in the space, that kind of that behavior, yeah. then there's nothing to say that someone can't then be like, cool, well, I'm going to codify that into a contract. And so now I'm going to, I've deployed this contract. And if you somehow kind of hook up, like if you mint to this contract or if you like call a function on this contract, then you know, we'll check how many people are in this wallet and then send you their Ethereum address if it's above a certain amount. Like all these things can be codified, but it is the human behaviors that we're looking for first, right? So, you know, it's the reason why collections exist today uh, in its kind of, in the way that we deployed it was we started hearing from big artists in the space that like, I want my own contract. I want to create my own contracts. And like, you know, they're, almost coming to a point where these big artists these like you know the parks of world and probably the people and uh you know these large artists who have been around from the beginning we're now like well i don't want to mint to your contract over here because i want to make sure that all my work is found in a singular place which makes sense when you try and then think about it from the artist's perspective in okay. this world in this world where they're like you know if you run a sh if you do your own show at a gallery you're not bringing in 20 <laughs> other people's pieces of work and you don't yeah. want to be sitting next to someone else's work on a wall uh, necessarily unless that's a conscious choice by you um and the way that we're kind of framing our collections as well is less almost about like you can have many collections right so you could have like a body of work that you have been working on for several years and you can mint that that contract and that's like your series of that body of work but then equally you might create these like big other series of works and you can mint to those collections and then because they're all stored in contracts they're all minted to these contracts on the blockchain it's really easy for anyone to go cool well i need to spin up a gallery space for like so and so's artist body of work it's like right well here's a contract address and everything's in there and like uh, everything yeah. in there is sense. just that body of work um you don't have to do any kind of crazy stuff where it's like oh well token ids one through 20 minus 18 are the body of work but then token ids 21 to 50 are this body of work like because then it becomes kind of weak tech right because you have to then rely on centralized databases to understand that one through 21 minus 18 is this body of work. And if those databases ever disappear, how do you know that that is a body of work anymore? True. Um, okay. So yeah. <laughs> that makes it, but is it this more for your more experienced artists then I'm taking it as the guys that are looking into these because I mean, creating a smart contract isn't something that is just not common knowledge, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, so yeah. <laughs> everything that we've done at Foundation has been to bring the tools that, you know, the top tier, 
blue chip artists have and try and bring them to everyone right so it's like it's great that like these top tier artists have it and they can spearhead like you know these incredible like ingenious uh, mechanisms but if they're not available to everyone else or if they're prohibitively expensive to everyone else then it's like that's that's not like creator yeah. focused in that sense um so we have when we approach this problem we looked at it in like what gives the strongest tech option like the strongest web free tech option um as well as making it affordable so actually now when you deploy one of these it's all like ui focused so you go in you type in the name you give it a symbol um and when you deploy that contract it's all done through the ui um and we've actually made it um due to like the innovations on like our protocol team we've actually made it it actually costs less than minting an nft to the blockchain so it actually costs like i think you know obviously it depends on gas prices but let's yeah. say between 60 and 70 dollars to like deploy your own custom contract so you could imagine that you could actually spin up multiple contracts because they're not that expensive and actually minting to these custom contracts is actually if you mint like more than say three pieces to this custom contract it will actually start working out cheaper than minting to the kind of core foundation contract because of innovations that we've built into it so it actually starts like over time you're kind of recouping the money if you were just to kind of deploy it to the foundation contract all the time so how do you guys make money off that then because obviously like the role like the role, you've got i'm assuming in your contract you've got a percentage that say that okay once it's sold it goes to yourselves yeah, so the way that it works is when you deploy these contracts, not to kind of get too into the weeds, yeah, yeah. but essentially <laughs> like, there's, when you mint a foundation traditionally, um, there are essentially two contracts that are being utilized. There is the NFT contract, which is purely what we would call like a ERC721 contract. That is like the NFT standards contract. That doesn't hold in it any information about like auctions or anything like that. But essentially, when you mint, um, you've created a token on this NFT 7, uh, ERC721 contract. Yeah. You can then, when you create an auction on Foundation, you are essentially kind of escrowing your token into our auction contract or our market contract, as we call it. And that market contract is the one that holds no information really about ERC720s apart from the contract address and the token ID that you're you're wanting to escrow. Um, but what it does hold is all the logic for our auctions. So all of the auction logic is obviously on chain. Everything is kind of handled there. So when you're listing something for auction, you are escrowing the ownership into that auction contract or that market contract. And then when that market contract, when someone kicks off an auction, the money that gets deposited gets deposited into that market contract or the ETH gets deposited yeah. into that market contract in the auction functionality. And then at the end of that auction, when it's like done and dusted and like the winner comes out on top and the time yeah. has ran out, um, when you settle that on the market contract, it distributes the funds. So it sends yeah. the funds to the original artist and it then has the ability to transfer the ownership to the, the person who won the auction. So when you're minting your own collection contracts, the same thing is happening basically. But instead of you minting to the foundation contract to create your ERC721, you're minting to that one. And then when you list it, you're just listing your collection uh, token ID into the market contract. Yeah. So we still take, um, you know, we still take the kind of the platform fees from the market because that's where it kind of sits at the market level. But you can ultimately do whatever you want. Like that contract that you've deployed is yours. It's attached to your wallet. Um, you can do whatever you want with it. Okay. So the, the, on a very basic level, and I'll try and I'll try and dumb it down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and tech correct from wrong and seeing like this is what is interesting. The reason why you, you what, the way you explain that is people to actually understand what NFTs are because it starts as a, a token and then is yeah. is self-executing contracts that are created of, of instructions or functionality to say that when this happened, that happens. So that's exactly and look at it as you've just said. You've, you've got layers, you've got the first layer, ERC721, you've got the, yeah. the other layer on top of it that says, okay, the marketplace, if you add, you deploy your own contract, you've got, you're adding that to that. And it's just when these things are happening and say, okay, now that's happened, this works, now that's happened, this works. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, okay. pretty much like, 
an ERC721 contract, like the NFT contract, is essentially really at its like pure basic kind of principles. It is the contract address itself that obviously gets deployed to the blockchain and then an incrementing counter, which represents the token number on that. So, you know, it starts at one and then goes up from there, increments from there. Um, and that token ID, so whatever number of token you've kind of like minted, has an owner, right? Like a creator address, like who owns that token? And that is your wallet to start with as a creator, but when you sell it, it gets transferred. And so it also has a few other things like the metadata URI that you can like kind of send data out to, but, and that's how it becomes like an NFT kind of more, uh, you know, how you can get more rich data out of it is like this metadata URI that corresponds to this token ID is like yeah. that data. So you'd go off and fetch that data. But really like the only things that are changing when you, as a kind of creator sells a piece of artwork is you're just changing who owns that token ID on that contract. So you're saying like token ID one on contract zero X dot, dot, dot is now owned by this address zero X dot, dot, dot. Um, yeah. And all you're doing when you're selling and kind of like transferring these contracts is just updating that field uh, on who owns it. So that is like in base principles, all you're doing things can obviously, so like the actual contract itself, the ERC 721 contract is pretty simple, like in its most basic format. Um, it is, you know, just an incrementing counter that then kind of joins an address mm -hmm. to a, to an ID where things get more complex is obviously in like your auction contracts and your market contracts, because they have to have, you know, countdown timers, like, you know, what happens when someone places a bid in the last 15 minutes, you then have to like increment that kind of, that kind of closing time by 15 minutes to make sure people don't uh, kind of, don't just jump in at the last second and try and win out the auction. Like it has to like give people time to respond. And obviously that's where the complexity sits. And that is also where, you know, where it's really, you know, it's really incredibly important to have good engineers who understand the language because you can go and create a 721 contract like in a matter of seconds. Like if you go to Open Zeppelin, which is like a, a company that do auditing, but they also have a very well established like set of open source contracts that are industry standard basically. Um, you can go and they have like a, you know, just a page that you can fill out and say, I want to min. I want to create a contract that has this functionality and this functionality, and you just check some boxes. And then at the end, it spits out the code that you need to deploy the contract. And that's been vetted and verified like hundreds of times over now um, because it's so heavily used. But the logic of like where money gets lost generally doesn't happen on that 721 layer. It happens in like the auction contracts and the mechanisms okay. that transfer ownership and hold money or eat values in escrow and transfer it back. Like that is where, you know, every platform is different because every platform has their own kind of like set of standards. Um, the nice thing is that obviously all of this code is on chain. So if your contracts are verified on Etherscan, then you can go and just read the code. Like if you're familiar with Solidity and you can verify that like, yes, this contract is gonna do what I say it's gonna do. Like it's not mm -hmm. just gonna like take my funds and not give me anything. Um, so yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm glad you, you know, I, I always like it. Like obviously someone like yourself has a knowledge about the smart contracts, talking about tokenomics and that side of it. It's good to have that and someone of your knowledge to talk about it because I feel people do get a bit confused um, about the, the NFT side uh, on a very basic level, just thinking NFTs, they say NFTs is art, but these mm. NFTs are just a technology. And Absolutely, <laughs> it's just a medium, right? Yeah. It's a medium like, you know, Canva, you know, oil paint artists paint on canvases, like yeah. digital artists paint in pixels and they just live in these blockchains. Like that's like, that's the canvas, the medium for the art. All right, so let's, get, let's, let's look into, tap into your one a little bit. I want to understand like, what things, what other industries are you looking on then? Because obviously you, you're, you're really focused on art because obviously foundation and whatnot, mm -hmm. but is there anything that you're looking at now project wise that is either coming up or have just recently dropped? Uh, whether it's PFP projects, um, do just collectible sports, music. Um, yeah. Discussion. So I think, yeah, the, the two main things that we've kind of been looking at are 
and like I think the wider industry has been like kind of looking at and watching recently with interest is like audio NFTs. Um, you know, the music industry has been pretty much has been broken for a long time. Like I don't think it's like particularly a controversial take. Um, you know, artists get paid cents on the dollar for like thousands of streams on Spotify and Apple Music. Um, and I think it almost feels like the reason why that it started taking off, like it started building traction. There have been some notable um, companies that have come into the space. There have been some notable musicians who have come into the space um, who have been selling NFTs of their audio. Um, and some of those have connected kind of uh, rights associated with them. Others haven't. Others are just like, here's an NFT of my music. You can buy it. You can be the only one who owns it. I'm still going to publish my music elsewhere and you don't get publishing rights. But um, yeah, there have been some really interesting and I think it's growing. And I think the biggest thing to overcome, again, it's not a technology thing, like storing bytes on a on the internet is easy. We've been doing that for years. Yeah. Um, the issue at the moment is the value prop from like the value proposition. Like music has been so downtrodden over the years where, you know, before you'd go and buy vinyl, you'd go and buy gigs, tickets, like, you know, and there people could command like a, you know, people could live off, off making music, right? At a reasonable level. Um, and over the years, it's now like the top one or two percent of like artists can actually like make a living um and the long tail of people don't make anything or not certainly not enough to live um and so it's actually been trying to how we change people's minds about music it's like look yeah you can you can listen to this track anywhere you can go on foundation and listen to this track you can go onto audius and listen to this track you can go anywhere and listen to this track but it's not it's not the the value is not in like listening to the track it's in this ownership of the track and like you are staking your kind of like uh this cultural event this cultural kind of moment is like yours to kind of like be the curator or the kind of like guardian of um and people are starting to come around to that i believe like people are starting to understand that like yes you know information being free as it is now where you can go and listen to you know you, i could jump into Spotify and listen to 20 tracks in the next kind of like 30 minutes and like you know that that's great and what actually that the idea that information is open and freely available to people is this kind of concept that is like it's open to everyone and actually the more people that listen to it actually adds value to it by hiding it away you're not giving it more value it's not like this hidden kind of piece of like it's not by removing it from society you're adding value to it you're actually by putting it into society and like making people like almost turn it into a meme that's what becomes valuable that's sort of like where the value add comes from because then you can point to it and be like i you know i've only nft of that kind of piece over there and like millions of people talk about that piece of cultural like song yeah. or audio or whatever um anyway uh so yeah audio to me is like a huge definitely i think it's good like to me, it feels like this is going to be the rebirth, like Web3 is going to be the rebirth of like audio and music. The way, the way I look on, to, to touch on what you said about audio, music and whatnot, the way I feel it's going to work is going to be on the whole connection with the artist aspect, because I feel that, okay, then yeah. years ago, we couldn't see what famous people were doing, but we can do yeah. that with social media. We can follow them and see, oh, they're down the road, they're eating their food and whatnot. Now, this is the yeah. evolution of that and being having access to these people. Yeah. Actually, potentially, you, you grab these nft this music it's going to give you utility to access to content um maybe behind the scenes yeah. or even meeting the person um so I yeah that's where ultimately it's, it's, onboard people. it's ultimately about like community right like you build up yeah. a community whether that's with other fans like real fans or whether that is with the artists themselves right and hopefully it kind of is a two-way dialogue um and i think like that is one thing that like you know you have to kind of appreciate about web free is it's so in tune with like this concept of community and like true community where it's like yeah you know i can listen to all this music but it doesn't like what determines that you're a fan is it the amount of times you've listened to that song is it the kind of the amount of times you've gone to see them live at a gig like have yeah. you gone and bought a uh, vinyl like it's really hard to understand at the moment like what makes you a true fan but i think like nfts and web free really help 
kind of solidify that kind of community that like you really have like skin in the game when you're like supporting these artists now. Um, but then the other thing, which I think is still much more nascent is uh, yeah, digital fashion. So yeah. that is like, I think is really like, we've seen a few of the very big brands kind of try and get into the space already by dropping like NFTs of 3D renders. And I think that's great, but I think they are, for them, it's a, you know, two month media campaign for the most part. And it's like, while the hype cycles up and it's like, yeah, right, yeah. okay, there's this thing, you get this thing. But I think there are some real artists and like fashion designers and fashion studios getting into the space where actually that is their sole model, right? Like they're really buying into this concept of the metaverse where, you know, you will be able to take your, your digital self around with you in like this kind of corporeal body and you can add dresses to it and like, you know, add outfits to it, add like customizations to it. Uh, and I think there's a few really interesting projects there. There's like Artifact, yeah, look, um, yeah, who have been they're doing. Just, they're just doing it with the phase, didn't they? I just seen it the other day. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, crazy. <laughs> and I think they're really um, doing some incredible things. Um, there's also uh, Fix, Fabricant, dressing. yeah, yeah. Wag Wagnisan, which is another one which kind of works with these like 10k projects to kind of create custom. You can only get them if you are like oh, an owner of like yes. another program. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think it's yeah. They're an open season, the and they got they got the bags and the the trainers. Yes. And stuff like yeah, that. yeah, 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 exactly. And you can. It looks like they're starting to get into something where you can like, you have to buy the raw materials to kind of then craft things later on, which I think adds like a really interesting aspect to it as well. So yeah, yeah. those to me, those are the two big things. Yeah, when it goes to fashion, what do you think is? The, th the most exciting part of it is it the the expression in regards to obviously when you're creating a piece of clothing there's restrictions in place you can't put that cd mm. you can't put that zip there you can't make things float around it but obviously with obviously 3d rendering yeah. you can do a lot more with that or is it adding utility to clothing obviously beforehand yeah you, you wear a piece, you, you wear your t-shirt and that's it but what's stopping you from adding media to this t-shirt like this, this actual has content on there that yeah, yeah. Can access and we'll read more about the brands or I don't know, an advert or so on. Or I did see, I can't remember what company it was before, but they changed, they, they, they had a tag on there or some kind of QR, I'm not sure what it is. And when you hovered your phone over it each day, the quote would change. Right, I see. Yeah, so um, yeah, yeah. A different t-shirt. We're well, a plain t-shirt in real life, but in the digital world, AR, whatnot, when people see it, comes to life. It comes to life. Yeah, I think. Change. I think it's definitely about. I think freedom of expression is like a large part of it. Like being able to create things that are completely out of this world that like can only live in a digital realm. Um, I think like the physical combination aspect of it is interesting, um, because. Yeah. I feel like every time you associate like a physical good with like an NFT good, it, it makes life a lot harder, right? Because you're breaking that, that divide, that kind of, you're crossing the, the kind of, the, you're crossing the barrier, so to speak. Yeah. Um, because it's like, you know, if you buy a t-shirt that comes with an NFT and then you sell that t-shirt to someone else or you give it away, where, like, where's the value? Is it in the NFT that you probably still hold on to? Or is it in the physical good that you've sold? Like, you know, it will be yeah. um, various different, like high, you know, high value kind of bags and stuff like that, but like, you know, possible to get hold of in the real world. But it's like, where, where's the value kind of like sitting? Like, is it having both of them? Is it having one or the other? Like, what, what's the deal? And like, if you have the physical item, but not the NFT, like, what does that mean? Like, what are you, are you the owner of it? Or is the person who's still, yeah. or are, you, are they two separate things living in? Like, I think it's going to be twinning, isn't it? Like the kind of thing like wax are doing. Yeah. Like the, it's, it's got to be, you can't, you have to sell that. You wouldn't buy, in the future, you wouldn't buy a, a physical t-shirt without the NFT coming with it. So I get a certificate yeah. because yes, exactly. it wouldn't make sense. <laughs> and I think, yeah, like platforms have to kind of set up to allow that to happen, right? Like they have to like be able to perform those transactions both physically yeah and also like um in like the metaverse or on web3 um but yeah i think it's it will be interesting to see kind of like how that plays out um i think once ar becomes you know 
I feel like at the moment, like AR and 3D are like getting there, but they're still, you know, they're still constrained to you looking down on the screen. I think like as the kind of, as the technology becomes smaller and more kind of like more advanced and it's just like in your periphery at all times, that's when like stuff will start to open up, right? right in yeah. that kind of sense. Um, I think until then, like it will still be held on to like, a minority of people who understand the technology or who are really bought into that community and like actively go out of their way to do it um, because to everyone else in the real world it just looks like a normal t-shirt kind of thing unless you know the underlying stuff well it's i think um, it's, it might lead through social media it looks i mean correct me if i'm wrong yeah I'm, like, you've got snapchat obviously with the the snap spectacles with the ar yeah, AR, you've got yeah. facebook with the ray-bans i don't think it's ar but eventually i'm assuming I'm sure they're going to have something that's going to drop yeah amazon google and if you connect it, if they start linking it with um, another idea here, I hope we get the credit. <laughs> if they start linking it, if they start linking it with their social media accounts, for example, so you can have something like a status T. So yeah. if you change your status, I'm feeling happy today, then that yeah, will yeah. also reflect that on Represent your T-shirt. On if, you. if you're angry, it will reflect that on yeah, your T-shirt yeah. also. So um, yeah, no, definitely. Like I think there is like so much possibility, and like all the companies are in this, you know, like. Apple's apparently building like AR goggles and like VR glasses, like, you know, Meta is doing the same thing. And, and holograms too. Holograms is a thing that we yeah, do. <laughs> I think this like, it's all coming out. So yeah, I think it's a matter of time, um, but I'm I'm excited to see where that space leads to, for mm -hmm. sure. So when this, like, I like to always like to round it off is, especially yeah. in your mind, because you've got a very good, um, uh, and, like, a good perspective of the space is, how do you feel the world's going to look in 10 years from now when you wake up in the morning? So I want you to describe how the day goes. You wake up in the morning and then oh, man. where's what kind of things, where does NFTs fit in your day? Um, whether it's yeah. going to the metaverse or so on, or you're buying something like from waking up in the morning, what does it look like? I mean, I, I kind of, yeah. So oh, that's a good question. I struggle to think about like the next five years, let alone the next 10 years. <laughs> I think, I mean, if there's one thing the space has taught me is that, a week can feel like two months and a okay. month can feel like a year. So if you kind of, you know, exponentially plot that on a 10 year scale, I imagine it will feel like 40 years to come. But um, in all I aspects, just like, have a bit of fun with it in regards to you looking at sports, tickets, collectibles, fashion, yeah, yeah. everything that like, where, where does it fit? So I imagine like, yeah. One thing I would like hope for is that my, I would hope that my physical world that I live in, like my home, yeah, is a lot less cluttered in the sense of like all these things that I like buy and put everywhere, either I don't know status or like yeah. look like the look of, is actually kind of transferred into like this digital realm. So it's like you know kind of everything becomes. I've just got so much stuff everywhere. It's like it's kind of <laughs> ridiculous. So that would be like one of my hopes is that. Um, yeah, this kind of world, like things become more portable in that sense where it's like, oh, great. I don't have to like load everything onto a lorry if I want to move or something like that. It's like, you know, hard, stored on a few hard drives or hopefully on blockchain. Um, I think, I think, yeah, like everything, I think NFTs will become so um, ubiquitous that like we'll probably stop referring to them as NFTs realistically. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, you're the same when you listen to like music on spotify it's like you don't say like oh, i'm listening to some mp3s it's like it's just a given that like if you're listening through headphones on your phone that it's like digital you're not like pulling out a tape or anything um so i imagine like everything will have like a yeah it'll just be like another medium of doing things so it's like yeah your i don't know your membership to a club or something like or a gym is like represents as an NFT as like the, the membership card, right? The, your, and it's completely portable. So it's not like, oh, I've got to go and register another card somewhere or I've got to go somewhere. It's just like, it's, if it's in your wallet, like your, you know, your digital Ethereum wallet or whatever, like it'll just work and that's how it is. Um, I imagine like, you know, obviously the obvious thing is like going to a coffee shop. It's like your loyalty card or whatever that might look like will just be like a set of NFTs that you collect. And it's like, cool, what does that mean? And I think it, for some places that is like, I think what will change is how we perceive loyalty 
right? I think it will shift to an ownership model as opposed to like a skimming the cream off the top, so to speak. So I think, you know, you would, I would love to kind of wake up where it's like, cool, well, like I'm looking at like, you know, I go to my local like coffee shop run by like some friends every day. And it's like, cool, like me going there is not just like me giving them money, which hopefully that, you know, is still doing, but actually results in like, you know, you being able to have a choice as to like what suppliers should they work with if they kind of open that up. And like, for some people that is like maybe a nightmare in terms of like decision paralysis. But I think, um, you know, if you're invested in it, then you kind of feel like you've got more of a stake. I would hope that like, if you start to kind of build a community around things, I'd hope that like, you know, whether it's like your local community, you feel like you've got more ownership in, in the physical world because of the things that you're getting from them like going to the park you know I'm going to a park and like you know they're deeply need more funding over in like in like the rest of the UK and stuff and it's like what if I can actually like help with that by like participating in something (laughs) uh, which then results in them being able to make better decisions or like decisions with some kind of capital behind them Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah so I would that, hope that, yeah. I was going to say that touching, that, what you're saying on there is like it's kind of going into the, the DAO side of it, which I know that yeah, you're, totally. you're yeah, interested yeah. in. So do you think that DAOs are going to be a thing that... Of the yeah, future? I think they will go hand in hand. I imagine that like, I think of quite a few people on the same thing, but like I imagine that the, where we are now with DAOs is kind of where it felt like we were with NFTs like two year, two-ish years ago, maybe. Um, and I think what we'll probably see next year but maybe on a more kind of in sped up timeline because it feels like every single movement speeds yeah. up the, the, the subsequent movements um, is that DAOs just become like, you know, again, it won't be like, oh, I've created a DAO. It's just like, just like you're like, oh, I, I haven't created a, a limited company or like a, you know, whatever yeah. kind of type of company. It's just like, that is yet another mechanism, but it gives ownership to the, to the wider community over as like, you know, some top tier banks, a few VCs and the founders. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I agree with that. Like I see that becoming a real thing. DAOs um, in the way we, we operate companies in the future. Um, is there anything else there that, okay, for example, social tokens? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think social token tokens will kind of play into this, you, you know, into this, like they already are right i feel like social tokens in their initial format kind of came a little bit before nfts in some regards in terms of it like there were some key players who made these social tokens to experiment with stuff um yeah i mean in an ideal world that would kind of those social tokens would go on to replace what we now see as like commoditized instagram and facebook right or twitter where people feel like the only way that they can currently make money through those platforms if they're a celebrity or a personality in that yeah. are through ads, partnerships, hoping to get likes to kind of increase this thing, which are, you know, completely arbitrary things that those companies have created to kind of like build a bit of a, a walled garden. And it's like, what if instead of that, there are, you can, yeah, you have a social token, you can decide how to distribute that your influences can have a direct relationship to like whether that value goes up or down and like Mm. what utility that has as well. Um, And I think, you know, hopefully then it will be about you choosing what you choosing, what platforms you want to use, right? Like each platform, like the way that I kind of see it is like that you'll have a choice of front ends, like front ends being the thing that you're obviously interacting with an app with. Um, and they, because everyone's data will be so much more portable because they kind of live on these contracts and these addresses, you will be able to kind of pick and choose like, oh, actually, I want to use that. Similar to what's happening now with NFTs, right? On like a smaller scale, um, what well, will be on a bigger scale where it's like, yeah, I can mint an NFT and that NFT lives everywhere and nowhere, right? Like it's mine. I have ownership over it um, and I can... I can decide to list that on foundation. I can decide to list that in my own custom like auction contract that's got its own mechanisms. I can decide to list that somewhere else. Like I can decide to just transfer it. And so what I would want is like people to feel like when you log on at the beginning of the day and you sit down at your computer holodesk, log into your VR metaverse thing, <laughs> um, 
that what you're interacting with is more because you've chosen to interact you've chosen that as a conscious choice like i want to use this ui because i've chosen to view my data through that because i feel like it it reveals the best data to me or it's like the best one out there um rather than it just being like i've got to use this instagram app because there's nothing else out there and it's a completely walled garden um so yeah I want, okay, I think, yeah. that's, I think that's a fair analysis of what where you think things are going. And that definitely, there's all of these key things that are happening already that looks like it's going to end up that way. So it's just mm. a case of just seeing how it turns out. But like, as you already know, things change uh, very quickly. Oh, uh, things change at a rapid pace. Too, like you said earlier on. And also as well, like, you know, Web3 doesn't live in a bubble, right? We are affected by everything else around us, like socioeconomic, socioeconomic kind of factors and, Mm-hmm. climate and everything right and you know worldwide pandemic so it's everything can change in a heartbeat and like it's not yeah we can't pretend like web3 solves all the problems because it absolutely doesn't but hopefully it solves a set of problems that impact people's lives like on the daily um so yeah i'm not pretending like trying to solve world hunger or world peace or anything like that like you know that's not how this works but i'm hoping that we can build tools and we can build an ecosystem that makes those things more tangible to more people where they can actually have more of an effect on people right like people can actually choose to ha- like give money directly to that cause or give money directly to that kind of dow that's doing some like interesting technology with carbon capture or whatever um so yeah okay so um we're ending on that side of it i think it's safe, it's safe to say that we're not saying nfts are a fad <laughs> I don't think so. Um, no, I think they will change forms many times before we like they end up at like a place where it's like, you know, they just become the norm. Like I think we'll go through many different stages yeah. uh, where they evolve and you know change. Um, but I don't think I don't think they're going away anytime soon. No. I don't think they're. I think they're pretty much here to stay now. Yeah, I mean, it's, mobile phones did the same thing, didn't they? Yeah. If the I'm, internet did the same thing as well right thing. yeah yeah of course of course so, so yeah, yeah it's exciting times but um where can if anyone wants to reach out to you where's best yeah. to find you yeah almost certainly twitter is where i kind of spend most of my time when i'm uh communicating with others so yeah i'm just um sam and then mdec so oh, s-a-m m-d-e-c and uh, so yeah if anyone wants to kind of reach out my dms are open i'm like happy to have to field any questions help people out with stuff um and yeah obviously yeah you can find find my kind of like nft collection on uh foundation for the most part under the same username perfect, perfect. so thank you for your time sam today coming on and blessing us with so much knowledge and i think it's been a great conversation so many gems lots of different areas we talked about especially the whole smart contract side of it i definitely think that was helpful a lot of people are going to find that helpful to awesome. understand what the NFTs are about, man. So, um, so yeah, um, I guess we're going to have to wait, see what you guys do, uh, get you guys on again at some point again. Uh, yeah, definitely. We can, we can Love talk to come on. All right, then, Brilliant. Cool. Well, Thanks thank so you. much, Sean. No, thank you again, man. Thanks for everyone listening. Stay listening and stay blessed.